Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam. <laughs> Welcome to episode 51 of the Mind Heist podcast, where we steal your mind. We steal it, we hijack it, and we clean it, don't we, bro? We kind of try and polish it. I don't know about you, I'm not really using polish, I'm more of a spit and a rag kind of guy. <laughs> Okay, that's gross. <laughs> <laughs> you know, funny thing, my granddad, he used to clean uh, clean the windows, clean the car, always, bro, just rag and spit. Wow. <laughs> and, and it would, like, make it real clean, not going to lie. Oh, so, <laughs> old school, bro. Old <laughs> before, school. Before polish existed. I, I think, think vinegar is a pretty, uh, pretty good one as well. Um. I was going to ask you what's the latest, but I think <laughs> the whole episode is going to be about that. Yeah, um, probably. Um, you know, what I wanted to say, bro, just before we start, you know, I've been doing something really cool and it's it's straight away. I can tell it's been a good decision. I have started delaying breakfast. So uh, try to get up, you know, pretty early and then I won't have breakfast until around 1030, you know, oh, okay. which is, I guess it's like a form of intermittent fasting because let's say. I the last thing I eat is 9 p.m. let's say uh, 9 to 9 that's 12 hours plus an hour and a half so it's 13 and a half hours without eating um, so I know a lot of people they do the 16 hour kind of thing with no food but yeah you know 13 and a half it's getting there and it's effortless for me you know because I, I get hungry in the day but in the, that morning kind of period I don't really feel the need to eat so much so that's been really good because I don't waste time in the morning like eating and of course eating takes up energy because digesting takes up energy so I found that really good man intermittent fasting kind of thing how long have you been doing that for uh probably a couple of weeks now oh alhamdulillah I tried it for a bit um mm. maybe a month or two ago um yeah it's quite straightforward and it's quite it you don't really start feeling it until just before you need to eat anyway once you're into the habit so yeah, I found it quite yeah. beneficial. Yeah, and it, like I never set out like I want to do intermittent fasting. It's just I woke up in the morning and I was like, you know what? Let me just work. Like, let me just start work now. Yeah, forget forget eating. And I realized, you know, it's ten. It's even, bro. Sometimes I didn't eat breakfast till eleven thirty, and it's genuinely because I didn't really feel the need. Like, I don't know. It's just something about mornings that I didn't need to eat. So. That was really good. And then what another thing I've I've done is I've started to have a salad for lunch, like just salad. So basically, like I might have some meat with the salad, but I will never have carbs. That's the ma- the overall rule. Right. So never have carbs and it just keeps me light. Uh, obviously I I I don't know, I react badly to carbs, you know, uh, after dhuhr, after lunch and dhuhr and stuff, I kind of my productivity will just take a crash. So I've just been keeping it light, having salads. And again, that's been really amazing. Um, I think it was harder the first few days. It was harder than it is now because my body was used to getting maybe more calories in or something. But uh, I try and make it filling. You know, it's not about not being filling. It's just about a more of a lighter feeling. So I put mm. oils because obviously uh, oils are, are ca- or fats are calorie dense, right? So I put some cheese, I put some oil, I put some avocado, you know, uh, these things are all full of fat. Um, and yeah, it's it's again, it's been really good. And I can see myself continuing it because again, it's not really a struggle at all. And uh, my wife, I'm sure appreciates it because that, you know, it's one less meal to cook. So it's really good, man. Definitely, bro. I've been... Um... I've been splashing out a little bit on more organic fruit and veg and not buying mm. meat. So uh, there's like a farmer's sort of local produce mm. shop nearby. Mm. Sick. Um, yeah. Usually I used to go straight to Aldi or supermarket, but mm. I'll go past there. And yeah, it probably adds up a little bit more pricey. Yeah. But I just, but when I try and do that whilst consciously not eating as much meat, it balances it out. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, so um, that. That's what ends up happening is now I'm genu- generally only having one meal with meat a day, right? Instead of yeah. like two. So, so yeah, it's good, bro. I don't really miss it, you know. I might have tuna with the salad sometimes, but that's... Yeah. I don't know if you count that as meat or not. And then I might have chicken. In two weeks, I've had chicken once, so not really much. Um, 
And another thing I've started doing is eating out much less. Like eating out can be quite pricey here, you know. So yeah. I've been eating out less and then it's freed me up to spend more on food, like uh, grocery shopping. And then I'm like, that's that's how I can afford to have like I put like whatever I want to put in my salad, I just put it in my salad because I'm saving money elsewhere. So let me yeah, let me buy that whatever vinegar balsamic vinegar that costs like ten pounds for the bottle yeah. or whatever. So yeah, alhamdulillah. Uh are you drinking coffee? No. I'm conscious that I might have some background noise because that's what the readings are sh- are showing me. But I can't be sure what right. it is. And I think it it, mm. it might be because it's windy and rainy outside and uh there's like some oh. sort of banging on my window. What's actually, if it, if you are hearing something banging, it's most likely my TV aerial that isn't connected to my house anymore because <laughs> I don't watch TV and it's literally dangling from the ro- from the roof <laughs> and hitting my window. <laughs> so that's, that's what that noise is anyway. So it's windy out there today, yeah? Definitely, bro. And I live right on the seafront, so it's mm. proper... Not just on the seafront, I think, obviously, we're quite elevated, so we're on top of a cliff on the right. seafront. Okay, um, so it's quite, it's quite cinematic, yeah, uh, but at the same time, you know, it could get really windy out there. <laughs> Achi tweet with the beachfront property. Well, you know, <laughs> or cliff front, cliff front <laughs> property. Parallel, yeah. I mean. So you wanted to um, quickly get the uh, curious cat questions that we had. Yeah, Do you want to yeah. address those and then I think there were a couple. Yeah, yeah. The thing is, bro, I I'm not able to log in. Yeah. Remember, oh, okay. I said before. Uh, I said before that I can't. Uh, you need Twitter to log in or something. It, you can only log in through Twitter or Facebook. Okay. So that's why I can't see the questions myself. Uh, essentially, I, it's hmm. it's. Uh, I'll, 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 we're having a, a, like an operational discussion now. I'll I'll give mm. you the login details. Uh, I yeah. thought I gave them to you, but I must have forgot. Uh, here we go. So, oh. These are quite long. <laughs> Sorry, apologies. Uh, let's have a look. I think they may be from all the same person. I could be wrong. Uh, so two of them are addressing episode 48. Mm. Uh, okay, the first one is, Salaam alaikum brothers, love the podcast. I try my best to listen to all your episodes and I find it so beneficial to hear Practicing Brothers' perspectives on many of the topics you discuss as a sister. May Allah bless you both and your families. Amen. Amen. Um, Anyways, I wanted to ask about something Amin mentioned about on episode 48 about bribery. When I visit my family in Kenya, I face some of the things that you mentioned in the episode where the locals basically try to squeeze money out of people. So how does one deal with that situation? I'm not from the area and I don't speak the language enough to get a pass. And even if I did, they would still make life very difficult for me. I would be put in prison until someone can verify my identity with paperwork or give them money to get me out. Mm. <laughs> you know, I, I've got to say, I'm not the right guy to ask. No, <laughs> because you just usually cough up the money, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, t- I spoke about this, be- but I've never uh, encountered it myself. I don't think I have. I can't remember anyway. Be encountering this, I have like been in the car with my cousin. So it's my cousin's driving. So my cousin's dealing with it, kind of thing. And I think I spoke about in that episode, like, like how my cousin would deal with it, like. He would just mm. make it clear you're not getting anything out of me. But he was he knows he wouldn't be in a situation where he would end up in jail or anything like that. It's just might he might, you know, I feel like often the the general general bad scenario, if you refuse to give anything, um, would be to get delayed by a couple of hours, two, three, four hours like that. That would. Yeah, that's kind of would be it. But if you're if you're a situation, you might go jail or whatever then uh, it's different, man. I, I don't think I can really give any suggestions, really. I don't feel qualified. I think uh, as a sister who possibly isn't from, like doesn't live in Kenya, so they're, I'm mm. assuming they're from the UK or they visit Kenya to visit their family, then I think mm. it just re-emphasizes the importance of not traveling alone. Mm. Um, and, I, you know, I, I I would advise not traveling alone if you were... A man as well uh from not from that country you know like in tunisia for example or wherever i go 
if it's if I'm walking around locally, then I'm walking around locally, and it's not really an issue. But if I know if I'm travelling a long distance, ideally, I'd like to take someone with me who's versed in the language and versed in the way things are there. Unless you're, you know, setting your roots to live there, even if you were to do that, I think it, it takes some time before you get to know how things work, yeah. to be proficient in the language, to be able to to defend your corner. Um, mm. And these things exist, bro. Like, so I know I, I think he was, yeah, I anecdotally spoke about a friend of mine that moved to Egypt and he told me of a scenario where because of issues that he had with, uh, I say a neighbor, but somebody who had neighboring land, um, this person made a claim against him, bought witnesses, mm. claimed that the, my friend had assaulted him. And mm. at the time this alleged assault had taken place, my friend was in the UK and he could prove it with his passport stamp, mm. right? But because of the bribery aspect of things, he said to me, you know what? It's probably going to be easier just to do my three months prison sentence than it is to fight this battle. <laughs> and that right. was his opinion at the time. And I found it mm. outrageous, but yeah. I don't, you know, I don't know what led him to that reasoning, but I'm saying that it can happen where... Mm. Because you, you're just not versed in the way things run there. You're not versed in the language. You're not versed in the culture. And yeah. what you can get away with and what you can fight back against, if you know mm. what I mean. Mm. Um, because like you said, your cousin... Was it your cousin you said? Yeah. Yeah, your cousin might be more aware of exactly. where he can... He knows what the worst case scenario yeah, is. Yeah, he knows where he can yeah. push back. And he exactly. knows where he, he's going to have to say, okay, fine, take the money. Exactly. Exactly. And you have to know, like, you might... Have, you have different ranks of like policemen or whatever, right? Yeah. So he's got that rank, so don't mess with him, but he's got this rank. Okay, so I can push back with him. Like, it's all these nuances that you just got to know, otherwise you're asking for trouble, perhaps. Exactly. So, yeah, I guess what, all we can say is just try and find out how things work. Um, get yourself, uh, travel with someone else kind of thing. And, yeah. You know, that's kind of it. And I think naturally for sisters, they have that... Um, the benefit of the dean on their side with it when it comes to not traveling alone you know um mm. some some people might see that as a limitation i see it as a plus i see it as a benefit that mm. you're not worrying about being uh, responsible for others uh you mm. you can free up a bit of your mind and your your brain space to to let someone else be responsible for that um mm. you know whether it's uncles or brothers or your father or whoever's available Mm. Uh, obviously that's not always an option I'm not trying to mm. be black and white about it but mm. if it is a, you know if it is there then please take advantage of it inshallah yeah 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 okay next oh uh, let me see I think this might be a follow on it says salam alaikum second question here Amin brought up a really interesting point in episode 48 about feeling that he is at a disadvantage for not knowing a lot of people and I've been feeling the same way lately. So, I mean, the self-proclaimed robot, how do you go about <laughs> building up your social circle? I have a pretty similar background. I lived in Kuwait for a, for a long time, went to America private school there, ended, go, mm. ended up going to uni in Canada and still live here now. Because I've been so displaced mm. most of my life, I've lost the opportunity to make mm. friends and acquaintances. Well, I mean, again, uh, how, I, I can't really claim I'm good at this because i don't have a good social circle but i i think i, I would actually be fine in, in different circumstances i'd i'd find plenty of people to connect with so what i would do uh is firstly most people are not uh self-employed like me so most people have work colleagues so work colleagues straight away is is a place to find uh friends well it's okay. even like you might have only one friend at work but then they connect you with other people right so it's it's not just people that uh, you could be friends with but it's people who can link you with people you can be friends with right yeah and then i think it's just about um going to uh, the kind of places or starting the kind of activities where where people that you have stuff in common with would go so for example um toastmasters you know it's a kind of a club for public speaking practicing public speaking yeah. that's the kind you have a, a broad range of people there but 
um, the type of people that are going to be there are, are generally people who are interested in like developing themselves, uh, operating at high performance, this kind of thing. So there, there, that might be a, an option. So start going to Toastmasters. Um, then uh, what else? So obviously, if you if there are any classes in your area like Islamic classes, those are the best because somebody who's bothered and committed enough to actually attend a class regularly is someone, inshallah, they're they're, they're committed to Islam. So it's a good friend to have. Um, if you're into sports, again, you're really into a sport, then go and join a team. Like, look at Facebook groups, look at, I don't know, LinkedIn groups, look at, um, what's that website? Uh, meetup.com, maybe. Right. Um, you know, meetup.com, you can use for, like, I don't know, entrepreneurs, meet up on it. Uh, but, mate, like, I don't know, I've never really used it too much, but it's like, uh, whatever you are into, just search that in meetup.com, see if there are any meetups. And it's not like you're in... Uh, you know a smaller city in the UAE like me like you're in Canada I'm guessing you're not in what's that middle of nowhere place Alberta I'm right. guessing maybe you're not in Alberta maybe you're in Toronto Ontario whatever these places are all going to have uh, meetups uh, and different activities so go over there go and, and it like maybe one out of three you'll find one person and the, the other two out of three are going to be like a quote-unquote waste of time but if you do that for three months and you just go out there, then I don't see why you wouldn't find uh, find people, you know. And then you've got the online avenue as well, which is, that's how I know Ahi Tweet. That's how I know Kaya. That's how I know a friend of mine in Dubai as well. It's all mm. online as well. So I don't, I don't actually think online is the most efficient way of finding people, but it, it is a, definitely an avenue, you know. Yeah, I mean, for myself, I... I probably argue now all but mm. one person that I'm close to. Um, mm. Actually, let's let's talk about the reality as it is. There is no one here now that I, in, in where I live at the moment, that I mm. associate with or socialize with whatsoever, mm. whether mm. that's work or outside of um, work. Um, mm. uh, but yeah, some people use social media and, and the internet and whatever. I don't, you know. Initially, I was using it as my prime source of socializing. Mm. Um, which, yeah, there's pros and cons, and there's a, there's a, hundreds of people that um, I only have ever spoken to online, but I could still consider mm. them a close brother of mine because of the dean and how the dean unites people in that sense, you know. Um, but I'd like to consider that social media is like a window to an area that you want to go to, as opposed to the sole purpose of it. So you might see events or gatherings or groups of brothers or, or sisters in your case um, sort of uh, collectively you know, going to events or meeting up or whatever it is and you'd be like well I'd love to get to know those people so without it sounding stalkerish you sort of social media allows you to see okay this is where they hang out this is the message they go to these are the events they go to these are the shiur they listen to and when one of those opportunities is available when an event comes up or you know you're you want to go to whatever city they're from you just pop your head into that masjid and you pop your head into that event you know what i mean like mm. you get to know that these were that these are the sort of people that i like that i'd like to know these are where they're hanging out this is where they're hanging out and this is where they're socializing and um i i say that because this like i've said many times this year has been probably where i've met the most amount of people in one year um ever you know that i've be become close to and, and good friends with um, and it's literally just been because I saw the brothers on social media. Uh, I, I made an intention that, oh, I'd love to have uh, a group of brothers like that. You know, you made mm. your dua and then six degrees of separation. You're always going to know someone that knows someone that knows someone that knows them. Mm. That's just I, I, always, I strongly believe in that no matter who it is. Um, mm. And, and that, that's basically how it, it went by. I remember seeing like people that were quote-unquote famous days or whatever you want to call them um for example i'll give you one like yusha evans yeah i yeah. remember i always wanted to to meet yusha evans um mm. i always wanted to sit with him but mm. theoretically i couldn't think of anybody that knew him right and then i, yeah. I thought okay uh the, the imam of my local mission knows this person and this person knows this person and this person knows yusha evans mm. right so i got to you know chill and i'm not saying that we're using people just to get to where we want to go but it's mm. just about developing those strong connections with various people that, yeah. you know, undoubtedly bring you closer to, to wider groups because each person mm. has their own circle. And if you're with the benefit of Islam being a 
almost immediately unifying entity. As soon as you walk into a masjid, you feel a connection to all of those people there, especially if they're your sort of age range, uh, that you wouldn't necessarily feel if you walked into a public library or, do you, mm. do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, you could sit with a group of strangers and they're all Muslim. And mm. as, you know, as long as they're probably at the same level of practicing as you or whatever you want to call it, you're going to feel an affinity there. Um, mm. So yeah, I think your first step is is capitalizing on the the brotherhood or the sisterhood that this DM promotes, mm. identifying what sort of people you would like to to uh, hang out with, and I'm sure a lot of people have you know have it in mind. And then it's just about making that investment in yourself by traveling to these places, mm. even if you know we've got the benefit of of staying in touch in many many ways now. WhatsApp group chats, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, whatever you want to call it. As long as you're yeah. using them to invest in yourself and invest in your social life, and not mm. using them to just kill time and and uh, develop this sort of unhealthy jealousy in yourself, because you can fall into that very easily. Then mm. I say go for it. That's all you have to do. You can't just sit around and wait for things to come to you. You're gonna have to. Yeah take steps to invest in yourself yeah i remember back in the day i used to always complain oh there's nothing to do here there's nothing to do here until i was 20 whatever and i'd not done anything (laughs) you know what i mean it's like sometimes you just got to be proactive and of course i you know i realized bro i think you know someone like me and quite a few people i know they're not too concerned about social life yeah Mm. um i'm fine just being in touch with friends now and then on whatsapp and then meeting up every two weeks every month like literally i've gone bro months without meeting anyone and i didn't mind because i I don't this is even before i was married right so i'm like fully living loner life yeah yeah but i literally i did not mind whatsoever because i'm i was engrossed in my work or my projects and that was that was me right yeah but you know i think i think women are actually at the core they're more social than men and so it's it's even more important for you to find friends because it will have a if you live a loner lifestyle that will have a worse effect than if a man had a loner lifestyle that's my mm. theory anyway so yeah and, and now that i remembered that it's probably uh, a, you know a sister asking the question then I'll just go all in on like maybe you don't want to go on these meetup dot com things in that case, but um, yeah, definitely masjid, isn't it? Masjid is where good people tend to link up. Um, conferences. Definitely. What's that? There's a conference that I got. I feel like Ayera or somebody from Ayera set it up. It's like they did. The, it's in Canada, I, do, I think, and it's like a, a ladies only conference. Okay. Um, I I can't remember the name. But, you know, these kind of things are where you want to go. And then there's also stuff like, you know, I think I mentioned a podcast that I, I'm enjoying, uh, Ibn Abi Omar podcast. Okay. And that's with Omar Uthman. He's based in uh, Texas, I think. Um, so him, yeah, I, I enjoyed his podcast. And then he said, give me feedback. So I gave him feedback, like I emailed him. And, you know, you never know where these kind of little emails just giving feedback could go as well, you know. So... Yeah, I think uh, a lot of ideas there, really. A lot of basically, you just got to be proactive because it's worth it. It's worth being proactive. You don't want to be in a situation where you've got no friends, and then you don't have any friends, and that's affecting your quality of life, like yeah. literally, yeah. And then because you're lonely, you're going out and making bad friends. Like you don't want to be in that situation, so you got to be proactive instead, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. I think definitely capitalize. Just capitalize on on the tools that are available to you. Um, I mean, I mean, uh, if we were to use ourselves as an example, we've met twice mm-hmm. now, three times, yeah. maybe twice. Yeah, twice. Yeah. Um, no, no, three times. Mm-hmm. See, it's, it can't even count it because uh, it's been so many. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, yeah, and I still remember the first time I ever heard of you, and it was mm. from a mum. Funnily enough, and I've said this to you before. Crazy. Where she she yeah. came up to me and uh, you were doing a lot of Sierra Master stuff at the time, um, and she said, "Oh, there's this really good Algerian brother. Uh, mm. You should check him out, sort of thing." And I was like, "Okay, mm. sweet." And then we followed each other on Twitter, and mm. I'm assuming we just went back and forth and commenting on each other's stuff. Mm. And that's how I develop a lot of the friendships I have at the moment. Some of the strongest mm. friendships I have with some Muslim brothers is just like that. Um, what through your mum? <laughs> <laughs> <yeah>, probably. <laughs> um, 
But um, yeah, yeah, and, and and you know now we're doing Mind Heist together, and we've done a mm. few other things together, and and I'm mm. sure if we wanted to, we could do even more together. If it, you know if the if the yeah. um, situation called for it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's just about taking yeah. those initial steps and not mm. being scared to speak mm. to people. I mean, you got like Kaya is a good example, right? Kaya found this podcast. I don't know how he found our podcast. He listened to it. He realized that I live in UAE. I'm self-employed like him. Uh, I'm trying to yeah, and he follow what Allah tells us to do. And so he just emailed us like, you know, and, and now like we're friends and I've met him a few times and I'm probably going to meet him many more times when he moves here and stuff. So yeah, that, that's an example, you know. Okay, bro, let's move on to the real topic, right? So the real topic is obviously, uh, bro, I, I don't actually think we were ever going to make episode on this because, you know, you kind of wanted to keep it quiet and very understandably so, right? But uh, obviously on Freshly Grounded, you know, you mentioned that you, you didn't actually mention your job, but it's like understood uh, from what you said on that podcast. So, so maybe before we even say what your job is and get into that those kind of specific like i remember you went to uni you did criminology right yeah uh and i think you were working in a retail job or during uni or before uni something like that yeah. so what happened what after you graduated uh, like that kind of led to where you are now yeah well I, i've been thinking a lot about this lately <laughs> um mm. and uh i think the biggest lesson i've learned is how important it is to uh do things that benefit you uh, as opposed to benefiting what people think of you. You know what okay. I'm trying to say? So, yeah. um, and I'll explain that as we go along. Um, yeah, I know I was on Freshly Grounded and there was, <laughs> it's funny because I told Faze, I was like, listen, we will, <laughs> you know, we might brush over what I do for a living, but I don't want to explicitly Mm. mention it and then he explicitly mentioned it and he was like oh mm. shall I edit that out and it was so late at night that I just thought just forget about it <laughs> oh right okay because um, it was really late and you know I'm not I still won't go really into specifics because I'm not I don't really have the liberty to do so mm. um, but I think many people already sort of can figure it out regardless mm. um, yeah so study criminology and I was at I was working in, in Clark's, the shoe shop mm. uh, retailer, right? Uh, in a stock room, doing a very menial task uh, over and over again with no windows, working on my mm. own. And you know what? And just to quickly interlude, like I've been thinking about that time now and thinking how peaceful it was for me yeah. uh, compared to now. Because um, I used to put my headphones in, listen to podcasts, listen to lectures and just mm. work, yeah. you know? Uh, and I don't know what it was that drove me to to put myself in a position I am in now, um, but I think I've started to figure it out. So, um, as you can imagine, if you've got if you're holding on to a degree, then mm. there's this expectation that you need to do something with it. Um, you know, how can mm. you go to uni and make that huge investment and then end up working something that really doesn't need it or require it? Mm -hmm. um, and with what comes along with that is the pressures that you may put on yourself from your parents or your family members or the judgments of other people. You know, I need to do something, I need to do something. But rarely is that, rarely is there any self-reflection on what you want to do there. It's just purely influence from others. And I think that's the trap I fell into. I think I mm -hmm. fell into this, and I spoke, speak about it a lot, about my father's opinion of me. And I think I fell into the trap of caring so much about uh, giving him something to talk about, mm. you know, something to talk to his peers about that I neglected what's beneficial for me, what makes sense for my lifestyle. Um, yeah. And, you know, put, put my father's opinion or any other person's opinion at the forefront. Um, and I know it sounds a little cliche to say, you know, do what you love or do what you're good at or do mm. what makes you happy. Follow um, your truth. Huh? Follow your truth. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's that notion. I always found that a bit like, well, come on, be <laughs> be serious. But I think I'm, yeah. I'm starting to value it more and more mm. Um, mm. when it comes to lifestyle choices. Um, mm. So I, I was I was already married uh, at the, when this sort of change happened. 
Uh, mm. And I, I'd had my son already. Um, mm. But I think at that point, the value of those two sort of elements, the value of that little family, hadn't really imprinted itself uh, the way it, it has now. Mm. Uh, and I think it's because when you put yourself in positions where those those things that you value aren't readily available mm -hmm. or you can't access them as much as you used to, then it becomes more valuable to you. And it's the same saying, you know, you don't know what you have until you lose it. And I'm not saying I've lost it, mm. but, you know, I'm still happily married. I've still got my son. Mm. Um, but not being able to see them as much, not being able to spend as much time with them, not being able to even have the mental uh, brain power to think about them as much as you used to because so many other things are in the way that's when I started thinking, oh my God, all I care about is my family mm. and I wish I could spend more time with them. Anyway. Right. So, sorry, I went on a tangent. Bro, just, just, just on that whole thing of Go for it. Doing, doing what other people are pressuring you to do or trying to make other people happy with you or yeah. getting validation. You know, especially when it comes to parents, the, obviously the cliche, like you said, the cliche is, oh, I need to do what's right for me. And these kind of ideas are very common to hear from young people these days, right? Yeah. Um, I think that is also now going a bit to an extreme, right? Where yeah, it's like, yeah. where it's like, no, like Islam says I have the right to do this. And so I'll do what I want. And my parents are wrong for pressuring me to do that anyway. I think we need to come to the middle where it's like, no, if you are able to please your parents, like go down the route they want you to go down while not like damaging your entire life or your entire future or whatever, then do that. Like that is a good thing to do. Definitely. The problem is when they want you to do something and you, you go down that route and it's actually a huge compromise mm. because that's when it becomes like too much. And, and that's where you should kind of, uh, then th that's when basically the time comes to kind of respectfully disagree with your parents and, and explain that this is too big of a compromise and it's mm. actually going to affect me because in the end I was, I was, you know, born alone, die alone, resurrected alone, basically, mm. isn't it? So you've got to, you've got to, if it's a huge compromise, that's when you've kind of got to say respectfully that I really think this is going to cause me problems down the line. And in the end, I have to, the, I have to, uh, live with the consequences mm. you know but when it comes to you know a perfect example i am uh egyptian my parents want me to marry an egyptian right mm. oh this is not fair what happened to islam multiracial marriage yeah, yeah. there's nothing wrong with it right but but the, my thing is is like your parents want you to marry an egyptian i'm sure you can find a very good egyptian to marry so just find a good egyptian yeah. to marry yeah. like why rebel for the sake uh, of it what I'll say is, you know, to add a, a really important disclaimer here, mm. because, um, you know, I, my mum listens to my advice quite often, and, and I, <laughs> I need to make it really clear. Mm. My parents did not tell me or promote me to do what I'm doing now. That wasn't, yeah, yeah. That wasn't especially my father, like, it was never in his sort of thing to, 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 to promote me to what I'm doing now. It was actually something yeah. completely different, and mm. I struggled with that. I think this was me trying to fill that hole that I of disappointment that mm. I felt I making up for father, it. making up for it, um, mm. uh, which you know I'm sure if I was to ask him he'd probably be like yeah it's probably not really good for you but mm. but he'd still I know that he'd still have some pride in it and to talk to others about it and I think that's me trying to make mm. up for lost sort of yeah you know lost opportunities yeah. or whatever mm. anyway so you yeah go so on. Um, as you can imagine. Uh, what what happens is when you're in that position, so you're working in, a, in an area that, you know, like a like I said, in retail or whatever, and you don't feel like you're doing what's um, noteworthy. I think that's mm. a good word. Um, you end up just throwing your applications into everything, mm. right? So constantly, you just, this whatever comes up, this will come, this will come, this will come, this will come. Mm. Not really giving much thought into the reality of what would happen if you got that role, okay? Mm. So you are literally throwing yourself at anything and everything. As long as the paycheck is a little bit better than what you're doing now, that's fine. That'll do. Do you mm. understand? Yeah. Um, and, and that makes sense, doesn't it? It makes sense. It makes sense. Mm. Um, and I think a lot of that comes with the, the, you're carrying a bit of impatience because you'd, you'd rather just get out any means necessary than get out well or get out better, mm. um, not just economically, um, but 
in terms of doing something that maybe you, you feel a, a certain way about or you have a connection to or you feel like you can excel in. Um, so, uh, long story short, I eventually landed a job in the emergency services. Um, mm. And, uh, you know, there's different sort, of, different sort of roles and responsibilities. And so I was doing a, a, a particular job for about two years but bro, when, when you when you got that job, your yeah, initial one, uh-huh. did you feel like what were your feelings about doing the job? Like, yeah, so, did you what were the reservations if you had any, or were you just so, excited yeah. to do it? So, so I remember I had some reservations initially, and you know, there's a long training period about actually not that long. I can't remember how long it was, but it was a training period enough for me to sort of have my doubts. Mm. Um, and I was doing it because I thought, well, this is the only thing I sort of had any return on. Despite the fact that I'd applied for 50 roles in the organization. And, mm. and that's not because, oh, I felt strongly about any particular of those roles. I just was doing what I said before, applying yeah. for everything and yeah. trying to make my um, degree fit. You know? and, mm. and the degree itself has an element of all of that because I didn't do the degree because I wanted to. I did it because, once again, there's this pressure to go to uni, so do anything that you can to do mm. that, you know? Um, okay. So, uh, yeah, I had my reservations, as you can imagine, about prayer, about Dean, about the fact that what was making me so uncomfortable in retail was just working for people and now I'm doing it again, mm. you know, and possibly doing it in a more regimented, uh, authoritative sort of, you know, your bosses are a bit more, uh, I don't know, a bit more demanding than maybe <laughs> in a shoe shop or whatever, you know. Um, mm. There's a lot more stakes. Um, Anyway, so I, I, you know, I was doing the role, and yeah, there was some. A lot of the time, it was really different and, and, and really exciting. But the responsibility in this particular role was a lot less, right? Yeah. Than, yeah. than alternative roles, and, mm. and I don't know. I'm glossing over it, but it's just I, I just can't really go into too much mm. detail. But there but were bro, some times where I've got a specific question. Yeah. So oh, obviously, uh, emergency services means working in the public sector. Yeah. Right. Means working for the government. Yep. Right. It was there anything different to you about that versus working for a company? Yeah. So um, you know what I will say. Mm. One benefit I found is that I was quite surprised at this actually. And I still am today. But their understanding and their promotion of of mental health of of uh, looking after you, looking mm. after you as a, I wouldn't say an employee, but you know. Uh, as a public servant yeah. is actually a lot more than I would have ever expected from them mm. and way more the consideration than from a private business right. um, because I've had difficult times when I was working because I worked in retail for about four or five years mm. um, and you know I've had hard times I've been super down <laughs> like I, I think I, went, was I, I was working and I had depression um, and it was it was sort of you, no one spoke to you about it. Yeah, they might authorize some time off, but there wasn't any discussions because a lot of mm. companies, private companies, can't afford that kind of help or assistance. You know, whilst yeah, in, in the in um in the organizations I'm working for now, there's a big the conversation about it just runs through the, com- the the organization. Everybody's gone through it. Everybody talks about it. There's all sorts of things available, whether it's charities, whether it's counselling, whether it's whatever, because. Mm. I think they've gone through so many years of overlooking it and it's had detrimental consequences that now they're really investing in it. And I think mm. because people that have gone through it from the top down and from the mm-hmm. bottom up, then everybody knows it's something that needs to be addressed. Yeah. You know, um, That's one th- main thing. And, and, and the way they look after you, or, or basically your concerns aren't necessarily uh, ignored. Mm. I, I, I've never had a problem with talking to anyone about any concerns I've had. Mm. Um, and I've always had a confidence that my concerns will be taken seriously mm-hmm. and um, th- things may be a- arranged to to help me because I've seen it with other people. I've seen other people in the organization go through some incredible uh, difficulties and the way mm. that the organization will adjust and, and shift things around to try and make it easier for that person. I, I, I commend them for that. I think that's phenomenal. Mm. You know, and I think it's really lacking in private businesses and in in the private sector. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So, I think public sector is known for that in a way, isn't it? It's like more flexibility, more maybe uh, concern for people's actual lives. 
Yeah? yeah, they're not they're not so much robots like in in the private sector, but then you take a pay cut sometimes, isn't it? For those, mm. you know, they try and make up for the pay cut by having these kind of, uh, you know, facilitations, mm. if you like. Mm. I th- there's a lot of you know workplace benefits and stuff that come along with it, yeah. um, but generally speaking. It's because, and especially in, in you know the emergency services, I'm sure it's across the board with all emergency services. Is that the demand for your time and energy is so much, and yeah. and the reason. So this is what dawned upon me as I was sort of doing my time, so to speak. Is that I would speak to everybody there, you know, colleagues and whatever, about why they're here, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of them would, a lot of them w- would go through their days. Yeah, you know, either stressed out, happy, stressed out, up and down, but this was their life, and they had accepted that, and this is what, you know, partially, this is what they wanted. This is what mm-hmm. they want. Their their passion. They've got a passion about this. Yeah, and I don't think it's possible to do it without the passion there, mm. um, without a reason, without when someone asks you why have you chosen this, and you get it, you get it whether you know. Uh, higher ranking people come in and ask, you know, start talking to you, you know, why did you do this? Uh, you know, why have you joined up? What's your purpose for, you know, what, what's your reason? What's mo- your motivator? Mm. And people will say, mm. uh, people might say it, you know, tongue in cheek, but I think deep down they have their core reasons. For yeah. myself, my core reason was me just almost lying through my teeth, trying to justify something to myself that maybe it didn't really feel, you know? Right. And, I, you know, a lot of the time I say, oh, I want to represent my community. I want to... Bring, make Muslims look good not make Muslims look good but mm. explain be a good representation yeah exactly mm. be a good representation of my faith and my community and stuff like that um, mm. and that's just corporate speak you know? <laughs> to <laughs> yeah, me it's know just corporate mean. speak because the real reason to me was what I mentioned earlier at the start of this was mm. that I was just doing it so that I wouldn't I was filling up this hole of disappointment or whatever you want to call it mm. um, anywho but I still hadn't fully realized this. And I think we started Mind Heist when I was still in retail, didn't we? Because um, mm. I remember having the idea back then. But I don't think it was until the this year or maybe the maybe when I was, before I got my sort of promotion or whatever you want to call it, that um, we started really deeply self-analyzing ourselves and, and taking Mind Heist to the next level. And this <laughs> is where, like, my self-reflection has taken, you know, way more steps because the way I think and act now and the way I think about myself is way different to when we started Mind Heist and I think a lot of that is because of the learning that we've had by speaking to each other every week you know mm, anyway yeah. so once again I fell into a trap because what happened is a lot of my colleagues that were um, in the role I was in were doing assessments for basically a promotion or whatever you want to call it right yeah now this promotion comes with a lot of responsibility comes with a lot of stakes um, doesn't necessarily come with immediate economic benefits, you know. Mm. The, the economic benefits are seen later on, and mm. for some unknown reason, despite the fact that I had it in my mind at this point that I wanted to to leave traditional employment and 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 work for you know myself, like maybe you are or maybe Kaya is, or do you understand? Mm. Like go down that sort of route of things. Despite the mm-hmm. fact that that was what I was saying, I said to myself, "Well, you know what? As a backup, I'll do the assessment mm. that everyone else is doing." Right. Okay? Just in case, you know, yeah. just in case, um, because the only thing that kind of uh, mattered to me was just I had a good group of colleagues, and if they're all leaving, then I might as well just give it a go as well, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm. Lo and behold, I did the assessment, and I remember we spoke about this on Mind Heist. Uh, you know, I was asking for the so I could pass and all these sort of things. Did the assessment, and I was one of the few people out of my colleagues to actually pass. Yeah. Right. So I was like, oh God. Like, I would make a do for it, but when I actually passed, I was like, oh my God, what have I done? <laughs> mm, yeah. You know? Yeah. Anyway, so I couldn't say that I was excited. I wasn't in a rush. And I remember people asking me, oh, you, because the courses were different. Like, you'd get a course either in July or November mm. is the next course after that, which is now. Um, mm. So I was like, oh, I don't mind if I wait until November. Like, I don't mind when I get the course. I don't mind. Like, subconsciously, I think I'm just putting it off because I didn't mm. know what I'd got myself into. But lo and behold, I got myself in the July course. And that's what I've, you know, I was doing. Right. Uh, since July, and that's why we had the amazing experience of having Mind Heist every week, pretty much. <laughs> you know, um, and I, I'll apologise to everyone if I'm rambling here, but it's, you know, I, I think it's it's more um, therapeutic for me to talk about it because I've needed mm. to for a long time. Mm. So, 
the course was from July, beginning of July up until a couple of weeks ago, right? Yeah, yeah. And in this course, you can imagine it's just a flood of information every single day. Mm. And what that what that does is it creates this level of anxiety in your mind that everything you're going to have to remember everything all at once and deal with everything all at once. Mm-hmm. And it, it's just extremely stressful. And once again, because uh, a lot of people that were in the course weren't have never worked in the organization before, complete outsiders. Yeah. Um, so yeah. <clears throat> they were getting asked the question, you know, why are you here and what motivated you to join and what, you know, what are you doing? You know, what are right. your purpose? And a lot yeah. of people would say, oh, you know, this happened to me when I was younger and it really had an effect on me and I really wanted to do it. Or, yeah. um, and a lot of people don't really think about the economy side of things or the financial side of things. They're thinking of with their, this is what I've always wanted to do kind of thing. Mm. And then myself, I'm just sitting there like, I don't, you know, I've said it to, I've said it to a few people there. I was like, I don't really think I want to do this, but I'm doing it. And guess what? Mm. The exams come in, the assessments come in and I'm scoring top marks and I'm one of the best scoring students or whatever. And I'm not trying to brag. It's yeah. just this dilemma that I put myself in. Like when I've got a challenge in front of me, I'll do my best at it. It doesn't yeah. necessarily mean that I want the result, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think this was the catch twenty two. So when I would speak to some people in the organization about my doubts, they would say, mm. Well, listen, on paper, you'd be amazing at this job. Like mm. you're you know, scoring highly, you've got the skills that are required for it, you know. Mm. So uh they would say, like, if this is something that you really want to if, if this is something that you decide that you want to carry on with, you'd be amazing at it. So don't ever feel like you'll be bad at it, right? Yeah. Yeah, and that you know that puts you in a weird position because you're like, well, I could do well here, but mm-hmm. my mind won't allow me. My mind won't it won't get it out of my mind. Mm-hmm. Now, the past f- few days is when I've sort of okay, I've been thrown into the role, and mm-hmm. I've never, I haven't, I can't remember the last time I've had this much anxiety before. When mm-hmm. I'm out there, bro, <laughs> I'm fine. Like, I do things fine. I mean, yeah. I do things to a standard that needs to be done. And yeah, I'm not out there on my own. I'm, I'm with colleagues, mm. um, at least for the first however long. Mm. Um, but you'll, you'll always have at least one person with you, right? No, not always. So this is it. Oh. So the first, like, I don't know, 15 weeks or so, you'll have someone with you. Mm. And then most likely after that, you're going to be on your own a lot of the time. Not all the time maybe not even most of the time but there will be times where you're on your own you've got to make those decisions on your own and the risks are on your own and whatever yeah um and then i'm uh, (laughs) you know i can't you know i get up in the morning i'm just the anxiety that's come out of nowhere to the point that i'm like googling articles about anxiety trying to understand it more and seeing if it's what i have and seeing Mm. if it's something more than what i think it is because Mm. it's not necessarily something that me as Mr. Mind Heist and Mr. Self Reflection and Mr. You know, ego is the enemy and the obstacle is the way, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> would would be, uh, you know, you you think I'd be t- trying to take my own advice with a lot of stuff, okay. but it's almost like it's a biological thing. Like you're you're there's a chemical imbalance that you've just got no control over. Like mm-hmm. it's not even something rational, um, mm-hmm. to the point where every night I've been waking up every two hours and everything I dream about so all I dream about is work and it's 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 driving me insane like all I can Mm. dream about is work and all I can think about when I'm up is work to the point when I'm at work that's all I can think about is work to the Mm. point that I'm someone who regularly checks my phone and I regularly have to fight myself to be like oh you know what you need to stop checking your phone you're always on your phone right right to the point where I can't even bring myself to get my phone out of my pocket because all I can think about is work it's crazy right you know, I will see. I, I, I'll, I'll get my phone out to check the time. I'll see messages from my wife, which is normal, yeah. and I'll yeah. just be like, I can't bring myself to reply because all I can think about is work right now, right. and it's driving me insane, bro. Mm. To the point that the, the the few times where I'm not thinking about work mm. is right now. But even I'm talking mm. about it, I'm speaking to you, or where I force myself to watch something that's completely unrelated. Yeah, you know? trying to distract yourself. Trying to distract but myself. You, you said when moments, you, yeah. For, for those few moments I completely forget but mm. then it just comes down yeah. like yeah, like a, yeah. you know like a yeah. anyway and it, and it, and it mm. started happening so I went to Morocco didn't I before I sort yeah. of started yeah. and the first half of Morocco was amazing because I felt free mm. and I was in holiday mode or whatever yeah. and you know my, my mum who's listening will probably tell you <laughs> that the second half mm. of my trip to Morocco was com- like it start. that's when it really kicked in mm. the anxiety it dawned on up. you and my mum didn't understand what was wrong with me and you know 
my wife I think more so did because I probably speak to her more these days which is a shame because you know I, I'm not living with my mum anymore I don't have that sort of um, ongoing connection with my mum that I'm always there with her you know yeah. Um, yeah and I think it was a lot of it was the thoughts and a lot of the stuff that I'd seen before and a lot of the stuff that could possibly happen probably scarred me a lot you know and, and I'll speak mm. about this um, now because it was something that happened yesterday and something that happened a few maybe a year ago or whatever so when I was working a year ago in the same organisation yeah I had gone to yeah let's let's talk about it I'd gone to a, a, a someone who uh, had reported that they hadn't seen someone in a long long time right mm-hmm. uh, so basically gas the gas people came to change or to inspect the gas in someone's address and yeah. they've been trying to go for ages, you know, and mm-hmm. every time they go, no one answers. Every time they go, no one answers, right? Okay. Um, and then eventually, I think they they, managed, they had to force their way in because, mm-hmm. you know, it was just becoming dangerous. The gas hadn't been inspected in months. Mm-hmm. And obviously, when they went in, the smell was, you know, horrifying. So mm. they called us. And I, and I went, you know, and I knew full well what I was going to. Mm. Um, but... You know, it was the first time I'd ever gone to anything like this, and I don't know. It was just, it was just, you don't really know until you go, sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. So I went, and you know, I f- sort of forced open the door, and it was, I couldn't even explain the the, the um, how the the house was. It was just an absolute tip, like mm. it was incredibly unhygienic. There was paperwork everywhere there was clutter everywhere you had to wade your way through and climb over obstacles to get to where you wanted to go mm. anyway and obviously as soon as it, so it was on top of a it was like a you know those courts like an estate so it was like as you're climbing yeah, steps yeah. to get to the to the top floor that's where the address was right you could see you could smell something wow i never smelled anything like it mm. you know and it wasn't until you get to the right door that it's just mm. It's an incredible smell. And I'm sure everyone knows what I'm talking about. I'm sure everyone knows where this Mm. is going. Mm. But the smell of, you know, the smell of a a corpse is something that, uh, there's nothing like it. And people say there's nothing like it. And there really, really is nothing like it. Uh, It's almost like it's hardwired into us biologically to to know that this, whatever this is, I shouldn't be Mm. anywhere near it, you know? It's not like... um, yeah, I'm not making jokes of this, but it's not like, you know, when you, like, a, I don't know, somebody farts or passes wind or whatever or burps and you're like, mm. oh, that's disgusting. This is almost like your your brain is sending danger signs, like danger signals to your mind. Like, yes. you don't want to be here. You shouldn't be here. This is dangerous, mm. right? So yeah. even the most primitive of a man who is out in the wilderness, you know, or yeah. primitive of whatever, will know that they don't want to be here. Mm. Um. Anyway. So, you know, wading through all this sort of stuff, and I know I need, I know what I'm looking for, and I just can't find it. Like, I know that I'm yeah. looking for somebody or a yeah. body, and I can't find mm. it. I don't know where it is. And yeah. I sort of, I, fi- I basically figure out that the bedroom, where the bedroom is, even mm. though it doesn't really look like a bedroom. And um, the bedroom door is sort of jammed a bit, and I'm sort of pushing mm. against this door, and there's loads of clutter on the floor. So I sort of trying to push all this clutter, but also trying to keep the place as sterile as possible because. Lord knows how this person had died, mm. um, and you don't want to mess up if it's like if it's a suspicious death, or whatever it is. You yeah. don't want to mess up any evidence, whatever. Mm. Anywho, so uh, yeah, eventually I just I sort of force the door open, and immediately I'm confronted with obviously the bed of this mm. individual, but there's nothing on the bed, mm-hmm. and then right at the end of the bed, I'm just there's something looking right at me bro wow. right at me like so it's on the so this person had had died mm. um, I don't know if he was sitting on the edge of his bed mm. or he was trying to walk around it but he'd essentially fallen and his mm. arm is still propped up mm. uh, against the wall and his mm. you know so he's sort of lying on his back almost but he's looking right at the door wow right at the door but when I say looking from what I can tell this person had probably been dead for at least three months at least wow. right based on the records that i could find mm. um the last time anyone saw them and mm. it, it's 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 complicated to put a number on it but i'm i'm estimating at least three months so mm. there wasn't very much of them left at all mm. right 
Um, and I don't, I'm not going to go into the gruesome details of it, whatever. Now, you could say that, oh, that must have been really, that must have really affected you, right? Mm. And you know what? I'm going to be 100% honest, as far as honest as I can be. I, you know, I dealt with that. It was quite a somber moment. And then I carried on my day and I carried yeah. on the next day and I carried on the mm. day after and I kept going and it was fine. Mm. And I rarely mm. ever thought about it and it never affected me, you know? Yeah. Up until last week in Morocco, right? Oh. So last week in Morocco, I don't know what it was, mm. and it just came back, like, just thinking about that door, opening that door and seeing that. It just came out of nowhere, mm. and it hit me up again, right? And mm -hmm. I'm just like, why is that in my mind when I'm just about to start again, you know? Yeah. And then yesterday... Um, because I'm working in a team of colleagues who are, you know, they're new, so a lot of them are going out to do different things to sort of sign off on, oh, okay, you can do this now, you can do this now. Mm. Two of them, so two separate uh, teams, if you want to call them, whatever, both went off to do the same thing I did back then, right? Mm -hmm. um, and they both came back, and I could see in them what I saw in me, and I was like, oh my God, I have to do that again. I have to put myself through that again. And I don't mm. know if that's... I'm not saying that that's where all my anxiety is coming from, but it might be, it might be building up. I don't know. Mm. Um, and you know, when you it, went it, to this property, were you alone? Uh, no. So I was with at mm. least two or three other people mm. uh, yeah. and a supervisor as well. So it was, yeah, quite mm. fortunate. Mm. Um, it's not the only one of its kind that I went to. It's just the yeah. first time I'd seen it. Ah, you know, okay. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. As it I mean, honestly, bro, it's one thing to see a dead person, right? Yeah. It's another thing to see a dead person after three months. Yeah. And I think what sort of made it more difficult was basically trying to figure out the story. Because mm. I was like, well, how can someone be here for so long and not know? Yeah. Right. And then it, and it, and it so, you know, as you can imagine with things like this, you have to try and find out who the relatives are and whatever. Mm. Found out that the, 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 so it was a man um, mm. and he had a son somewhere in another town but his son didn't want anything to do with him because his father was an alcoholic right, right. so this person you know i can imagine i I'd only assume because once i'd done that day that was it i never looked into it again nothing to do with me I don't want anything to do with it sort of thing i didn't need mm. to there was no responsibility for me to do anything further mm. um so yeah he and then it made me think well i've got you know i'm, I'm a son to a father Mm -hmm. you know mm. um, I'm not saying my father has those issues I don't have anything against my father but like it just made me think well my relationship with my father was to ever deteriorate and I was mm. imagine if I didn't have the dean within me to, to emphasize the importance of it of preserving that relationship yes. you know then, then, then I, I could easily have abandoned my father and then think about mm. me and I have a son what if my son was to grow up and abandon me in that sense because mm. of my own actions my own yeah. you know if I was to do something that was awful or to be a person I didn't want it to be Mm. And my son didn't want anything to do with me. Then that, you know what I mean. And to yeah. think that this individual had died, looking right at the door, mm. died on his own in his room, and nobody really yeah. knew. Yeah, that's the time. sad part. Yeah, that's that. That was the sad yeah. part. I think that um, adds to the whole context, right? It's not that somebody is dead, right? That's normal. That's part of life. Mm. You know, people that people die, especially as Muslims, we're told to remember death. We're yeah. told to wash the body. We're told to attend the janazah, right? So it's yeah. it's embedded in our life and we should consider that very normal and something yeah. we're used to. The problem is the added uh, circumstances, isn't it? That mm. this person had been dead for a long time. And then they saw the whole backstory of, oh, their house is like, a tip like you said mm. the house is messed up so it means they weren't even when they were alive they weren't probably living a very good way in a very mm. good way in a very I, dignified way and, I think and yeah we we um you know i've said it before on mind heist how we we are the main character in our own movies okay um, you know and we give our own lives a certain level of importance because we are living our own lives yeah um and and we uh we we're obviously social creatures, right? Mm -hmm. And and we have an experience. We have memories. We have nostalgia. We have you know we can remember our childhood up until, you know, our later years or our, up until now. And mm -hmm. we've developed so many relationships along that time. And we're conscious of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. We're conscious of the akhirah. We're conscious of our actions um, having consequences, right? And this person, to the best of my knowledge, wasn't a Muslim. Okay, mm -hmm. so they'd lived their life from start to finish not necessarily being Muslim. Mm. They lived their life from from whenever to finish being mm. an alcoholic, right? They mm. lived their life from a certain time to, to the end being alone, mm -hmm. right? 
um, but they were the main character of their own movie. Mm. So they were giving their life a certain level of importance because that's normal. Yeah. So the so the sad reality is that they went through their whole life misguided, mm. um, you know, in the sense that they weren't conscious of their actions having consequences or they were struggling to, to overcome them and mm. they were left alone and mm. then they died in that state mm. and then they were forgotten even when they died. They were forgotten mm. immediately after. And I think one of the most beautiful things of death in Islam is that even if a Muslim was to die and they didn't have anyone, well, at le- we'd, le- we'd say at least we'd like to think they have the ummah around yeah. them. You know? Yeah, they have the, the local masjid who will pray on them. Yes, and mm. maybe people fundraising for their funeral or whatever. Yes. And, um, yeah. and like we were talking about at the beginning, and I think it's a good thing to talk about again, is how we have those social circles that despite the fact that you don't know anyone, as mm. long as they're Muslim, there's a level of connection there. You know, because for you're sure. both going to yeah. say Bismillah before you eat, and you're both going to say Alhamdulillah when, some, when someone you know, sneezes or whatever. You know, yeah. Yeah. minor, yeah. minor things, but there's a bond there. Because if I walked into a room, I mean, with a complete stranger who was Muslim, and mm. I was to die right there, mm-hmm. right? Immediately, they would know that uh, they would know that what they'd need to do not not what they need to do, but they would understand what's going on. Yeah, you understand? They would. It's it's hard to explain what I'm mm. trying to say. Yeah, but there's a level of understanding, you know. Mm. Um, Bro, what what you're saying is this is a very I think very important point, uh, but it might not seem connected. But I'll explain. Yeah. Go for so, it. so this man, like you described him you know miskeen in the end yeah like you said he he lived his life uh maybe without without guidance without being uh without you know his creator in his life if you like um he he abused him his body and his his soul uh you know through alcohol and stuff mm. and he died that way right and this this should remind us this should be a reminder for muslims to to be very proud and very external with our islam because this is the consequence of people not knowing about Islam, not hearing about Islam, not being told about Islam. So by you, inshallah, by you going out there with your beard, with your jilbab, with your this, with your that, mm. by you saying, by you saying, oh, yes, Ramadan, yeah, it's really great. Oh, we do this and that. Or, oh, just uh, give me five minutes. I've got to pray. By exposing people to Islam, you are hopefully doing your part in helping people avoid the outcome of this poor man. You know, that is the connection that we need to make. When you think of that's that's why the Prophet Sallallahu he was so concerned with the Mushrikeen. He was concerned that they were going to die in this undignified way. Mm. And that, he had real concern. And your concern for people should translate into you being very open about your Islam because that is the salvation for them, isn't it? Definitely. And, you know, to, to go back, like, you know, even yesterday, so... I didn't attend yesterday, but even yesterday, the the individual that, that died had, like, I had to because we have to process these images. So I saw an image mm. of it, mm. and you know, it wasn't it wasn't too dissimilar to what I'd experienced. But this individual had um, died on his sofa, mm. but on his, but like sort of fallen on his table, uh, you know, mm. coffee table, and his coffee table was littered with drugs paraphernalia. You know? mm. So it could have been, I don't know, uh, you know, uh, assumption here, but it could have been like a drugs overdose or something along those lines. Mm. And Allah knows best. Mm. Um, but this, once again, you know, dying alone, um, because this person had, I don't know how long they'd been there, probably not as long as before, but definitely been there long enough that people didn't notice for a, for a, right. you know, maybe a week or two, you know. Mm. Um, and, and, and this is this is it once again. It's Now, yeah, just to put, put a break on that sort of, topic matter for the moment like how does that relate to to myself and employment and 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 all of this i mm. still haven't figured that out yet i don't know if that's what's making me uneasy i don't mm. necessarily think it is mm. it's the same feeling as i had before of which i've mentioned many times on mind heist which probably people are getting sick of um but <laughs> you know the idea of working for someone else the idea of not being in the control and mm. i think i think what what's manifesting itself is that i am now in less control than I ever, ever have been uh, in terms of employment because of the unpredictability of what could happen next. You know, the unpredictability of what my responsibility dictates for me next is so, um, so broad to me at least that I think that's what's giving me the most anxiety. Mm. To go from a, a, a role that you go in in the morning and you know what you need to do more or less you know and there's vague yeah. vari- you know very minimal variations 
but you know that okay you know these shoes need to go here and they need to go in these boxes and these customers need that and yeah you know, it's sort of although yeah people will be like oh, i'm bored and it's you know monotonous and whatever you kind of have the comfort of knowing what you're you're going into yeah and i think the unpredictability of what i am doing now combined yeah. with the demand that Islam has upon us to be rigid with our prayers and rigid with our routines in terms of Islam, right? Mm -hmm. That is probably what's causing me the most anxiety. And combine that with the fact that I just, I'm not in tune with my family anymore. You know, mm. I just don't, like I'll come home and I'm not on the same wavelength anymore. Um, mm. and that's what's troubling me because mm. my dream, <laughs> my dream is to just, get my you know desktop computer and be sitting in, and have it set up in the living room with my family and work like that and every now and again turn around play with my mm. son speak to my wife and go back to work you know yeah. and i don't know how that you know your setup is and i don't know that that would definitely not work bro huh? <laughs> that would definitely not work <laughs> no i know it definitely not work i understand that that's gonna stay that as a dream i think <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying that's where the, the main work would go, but I'm saying if I yeah. needed to quickly do something, yeah, that's what I yeah. did the other day. You know, mm. and I'm not saying I've, I've given up on the dream, bro. Like I'm still trying to do things. And the, the yeah. other day, um, you know, I put this laptop that I'm using to record now, I put it up on the, the coffee table in my living room and I just quickly set up something on a website and then I turned around to my son and I played with him quickly and then I went back, finished off what I needed to do. And just that moment meant so much to me because mm, yes. that was like... It was almost like a glimpse into what I just what works for me, what's perfect for me, mm. um, and yeah, yeah, what you know the feelings I am battling, and I'm sure if anybody relates to what I'm talking about now, the feelings that I'm battling are the selfishness that I might feel because I recognise that what I'm doing is something that needs to be done by someone. Someone has to do what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. whether yeah, that's in that's a Muslim true. society or not, someone has to mm. do it, and we can't yeah. all say, "Oh, I don't want to do that, and I'm going to do something else." someone has to do someone has to fill that that gap but yes what i try and do to rationalize that is to say well look at the people i spoke to at the start i said i spoke to people and i asked them why they wanted to do this and mm. all of them gave me a legitimate reason more or less you know yeah. all of them whether it was as you know as shallow as i just wanted to do something different and exciting well, that's still mm. a reason you know yeah. but that yeah. wasn't my reason mm. <laughs> you, mm. you understand i can't legitimately yeah. say yeah i just yeah. wanted to do something exciting <laughs> I've yeah, bro. Like you that. know, I can, I can actually relate to you, and I didn't think, I didn't think I, I've ever been in the situation that you described to me um, before. But uh -huh. I, I actually can relate, and obviously the job is completely different. But mm. I remember when I was doing my uh, teacher training, I, I, I was doing, I wasn't doing it for a few days like you. I'm talking about week after week, yeah. going in feeling that anxiety, right? Yeah. And also, when you're teaching, again, there's the a level of unpredictability as well. Although, of course, you you have you have uh, planned your lessons, but it's like <laughs> the kids can ruin your plans, right? Of course, of um, course. And so, I think, bro, I think there's there's two kind of aspects, uh, two things potentially going on, right, in terms of causing you to feel uh, the way you're feeling, right? Firstly, is and that's why I, I I think it's very good to discuss this because it's like a real example, yeah. Um, when you're You've got to know what's normal and what's not normal when it comes to your your body and your mind. Yeah. So when you stub your toe, it hurts. You're not worried because you're like, yeah, I understand that that's what should happen. I should feel pain when I hit myself. Right. Um, when it comes to doing something brand new, something where there's potential danger involved, something where it's like you've you actually built it up in your mind so much because you've been training for it what's the logical conclusion of something that you need to train for a lot it's that it's going to be demanding so all of these things come together to say uh you should be worried about this thing right mm -hmm. and so the fact that you're feeling worried slash anxious is pretty much the same thing the, the the fact that you're feeling that way is absolutely normal like that's why and i think a lot of people when they feel that way they might start thinking they have mental health problems it, it's i you know strongly disagree with that you should be feeling anxious right <laughs> because everything rationally is pointing to the fact that you're going out every day to do something which is completely out of your comfort zone brand new potentially dangerous 
a lot of uncertainty, everything that humans are kind of designed to avoid, and you're going out there and doing it. So you should feel an anxiety, right? Uh, the thing is, though, is that it shouldn't last beyond, uh, uh, you know, somebody qualified be able to put an actual time frame yeah. on it. I, I would say maybe if it, if it's continuing beyond like two months, then that's when maybe it's like, okay, now it's kind of abnormal. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so that's one thing, right? I think we it's very important to mention this, like just because you feel anxious, like being anxious is a natural thing that your body has built in for good reason. So feeling anxious is not, doesn't mean you're ill. It doesn't mean you have a mental illness, yeah? Um, the other thing is, um, oh, oh yeah, maybe, maybe, bro, the fact that you're, you feel like this new role is taking a, you away further from your, what you want to do, basically, what you want to be doing, which is what yeah. you just described, yeah? You feel it's taking you even further away, and therefore, your mind is subconsciously creating obstacles in this new role. It's making you feel such an aversion to the role because of how deeply it goes against what you actually want right yeah. that that's a potential reason as well your, your mind is making this to be even bigger than it actually is because deep down it, it it's at conflict with your kind of inner goals if you like definitely and, and i mm. you know what i agree with that the latter so much because mm. i know that with anything knowledge is power right mm. knowing you know it's not necessarily dealing with stuff it's knowing what to do and when to do it and that's mm. the most thing that drives me the most Mm. anxiety is like oh what if I'm in a situation I just don't know what I need to do because mm. I don't know this and this and this and this and this and this yeah right now I know that anything can be overcome with learning in the sense that if you learn yeah. about a, an obstacle then you know everything about it you know that whatever situation you're thrown at more or less mm. you're going to have an idea of what needs to be done mm. um so and, and, and I see that because I see people that were colleagues of mine that went off did the same thing that I'm doing now and now they're fine and they're getting things done um and obviously I'm, I'm partnered up with someone that's way more experienced and he had this conversation with me um a couple of days ago he said uh, you know how you know how you doing how 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 are you feeling about everything and i i don't know why i told him um because mm. this is something you necessarily necessarily say to to people i was just like you know what mm. i don't know why but i'm waking up every morning ridiculously anxious and he was mm. like well he was really surprised and he goes, oh, oh that doesn't make you feel good, does it? No, 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 not like that. And I'll tell you why he was surprised. Yeah. He was surprised. He was yeah. like, oh, really? He goes, you don't come across as you are. And I was oh, like, okay. I don't know, yeah. maybe, uh, maybe I'm really good at hiding it. He goes, well, when you, you know, because mm. he's observing me and seeing how I do. He's like, well, when you're talking mm. to people, you're completely confident. You sound like you know exactly what you're doing. Even if you're not 100% sure, they don't know that you're new. Yes. Like, yes. I don't give the impression that I'm, you know, new or whatever. Mm. Um and I don't know if that's just my ability to talk or whatever, and the ability to have a conversation. And I think mm -hmm. that's probably one of my strengths is I can just talk to people. Mm. Um, but I was like, well, yeah, I might be, I might be hiding it really well. Um, mm. It might not be as bad when I'm out there because I'm not thinking about that. I'm thinking about what's in front of me. Um, mm -hmm. But when I'm at home, all I can think about is what could happen as opposed yes. to, when I'm out there, I'm thinking about what's happening right now, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so he said to me, uh, you know what? I've been doing this job for God knows how many years, over a decade probably, mm. uh, I think he said. And he said, you know, sometimes, I didn't have anxiety before, but sometimes if I've just had like a, a few days off and I'm about to start my week again, I just get, yeah. up, I, this, I can't sleep the night before. You know? And I was mm. like, well, I'm, I'm having that every night. Like every mm. night. And I know it's only been like less than a week. But I can't yeah, sleep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, and when I do sleep, it's all I'm dreaming about. Is this so mm. irritating because mm. I just want to break? Mm. Um, yeah, because your your body thinks it's an existential threat. Yeah. And honest, let's be real. It might be right, yeah. but it, it's you know when we rationalize it, we're like, yeah, the percentage is X Y Z that this could happen, and blah blah blah. But your body is like, look, <laughs> there's danger out here. <laughs> I don't, you know what? And I don't even think, I don't even think like that. Like that's not even at the forefront. Mm. What I do think about a lot is just, uh, it's, it's basically how this is consuming a lot of my time mm. that Mental, otherwise would have yeah. allowed me to focus on my dean, focus on my family, yeah, yeah, focus yeah. on other avenues yeah. out of, of there. You yeah. know, like right now. Yeah. So for example, right now, I know it's not a ridiculous sh shift, but right now I've got to start work. It's 1120 at the moment. And I've, I'm working at three, 
and I finish at two o'clock in the morning. Mm. Right? So, and then obviously t- t- time it takes to come mm. home and all whatever you want to call it, which is an, a ridiculously bad shift. Mm. That's eleven hours, right? Yeah, yeah, I think it is, but mm. it's still a large chunk of my day. <laughs> no, know? but bro, that that is a that is a bigger chunk than our office work. Obviously, yeah, it's like mm. three hours longer or whatever. Um, they get an hour lunch break, of course. But yeah. the thing is, it's it's it can be mentally exhausting to be on high alert. Like just being on high yeah, alert exactly. is tiring. Exactly, and I think that my issue is I've been I've been on high alert for twenty four hours. Yeah, <laughs> because for real, yeah. And then sure, the, the, yeah. the thing, what well, the thing that my mind keeps telling me is that that's eleven hours of things can go wrong in eleven hours. How many things can go wrong in eleven hours? Yeah, it's not yeah. like a job where you're going to go to do something and you're doing one thing, like you're working on one task for yeah. eleven hours. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you could say from nine to five, I've got a project I need to complete. That's the project I need to do. Mm. I'm walking to work knowing that that's what I need to do, that specific thing. Yeah. Um, and that's what I'm aiming to complete. Here, you you don't know what the project is because mm-hmm. it could be anything. You won't find out until you get there. And that one project won't be the only thing you deal with. So once you deal with that, it's not the end of the world. It's not the end of the, it's not the, yeah. end of the your day. Yeah. You've yeah. got to be ready for the next thing that could just crop up. And yeah. you know how how long do you think you have to prepare yourself mentally for whatever you go to in a yeah. city? Three minutes. <laughs> yeah, in a city, it's a few minutes to get yeah. from one area to another. You know, at high speed. Yeah, it's a very short amount of time to get yourself yeah. mentally prepared. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's crazy, bro. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. That, that's what I'm saying. As well, when I was teaching as well, I was exactly the same as you. I was very collected in front of people. They had no idea what was going on in, inside and everybody was saying you're good at this like yeah. you're gonna like everything is showing that you're a good teacher and when i look at like the criteria for what is a good lesson i'm like okay yeah done 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 like i have i had pretty good control of the kids i'm like look if i finish the training i do one full year of this as a as an actual full time job I'll be good. I'll have lesson plans. I won't have to worry about planning every single lesson. It'll be already done. I'll, mm. This anxiety will probably go away. Um, I'm, you know, and I, I try to really dig into, okay, why do I feel this way? Oh, it's because of this and this. And, uh, you know, my mentor or whatever was telling me, you know, you seem great. Like, and, and when, it, when it was getting towards the end of the training, like the, the whole PGC thing, they're like, okay, so like, like what jobs have you applied for and this and that? And I'm just like, I don't want to do this. And they're like, what the hell? Like they yeah. could, they, they're like, oh, but you're so good and you're like natural. And I'm like, yeah, I, I don't think I ever really told them. It's just because it was driving me nuts, the anxiety and all that. Yeah. But, um, but they didn't get it. Right. And in the end, you know, I concluded that it, it could, I could stick with it for do a whole year, full time, proper year. And it might go away. But I just concluded that, I wasn't invested enough and motivated enough in the long term outcome of that for me yeah. to to spend another year potentially like this, you know. Yeah. And that goes back to what you're saying, where it's like you're not even fully invested in this job. So, w- what's the motivation to go through this hardship, if you like? Exactly, you know, little things. A lot of people join jobs like this because of the long term benefits of it, like a pension, for example, like a good mm. pension or whatever. Yeah. Not even in like you know yeah exactly i don't yeah. even you know i opt out of stuff like that anyway so, mm. so mm. <laughs> um but um yeah i think you know i'm really interested in 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 looking into more about your sort of journey and obviously because i don't know i don't know how you feel about me saying this but sometimes i see your situation as one that i would rather be in <laughs> you know that's the mm. sort of, that's where i'd rather be and that's my sort of goal not necessarily mm. doing exactly what you do Allah knows mm. best i know yeah. you haven't really spoken about what you do uh, mm. explicitly but mm. you know everyone knows that you you know you, generally you're you know you work we do business huh business <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah but, you know so, you, you, yeah. you went through what you've just said and you decided that it wasn't for yeah. you and the, the i think thing though is, yeah. go on the thing is bro um i i decided against continuing in that kind of uh, lane um but then you know and i i wanted to be self-employed i always wanted to be self-employed and after a few months of failing to become self-employed, because you know being self-employed requires you actually make money, right? Yeah, um, exactly. I actually I decided I will get a job, right? And and you know I, I've mentioned before in probably in some of the first episodes that you know I I went and I got a job and it wasn't a teaching job and it, I didn't have that killer anxiety as much. Um, 
but you know i ended up you know basically getting fired from that and so i was forced into in a way i was forced into actually taking the plunge and actually starting something for myself yeah kind of thing it wasn't my goal was to actually have a job and start something for myself on the side you know i yeah. thought that was the wisest thing to do um and and you know yeah. what on on that point that mm. is what i had in my mind as well yeah yeah um, but but you I, now you're probably thinking if i'm feeling like this how am i going to come home and then spend time yeah. with family and work on this side thing like exactly and that's seems why, impossible yeah. that's why i feel like the walls were closing in because yeah, yeah. i can't think of anything else and i never thought it would be this bad i yeah. thought that i could leave work where work is and come home yeah and leave you know, it at the door to, yeah the fact that you know i'm even recording this episode today um mm. is a, a bit of a miracle because before we before you know we record at 10 a.m before 10 a.m since mm. seven in the morning or even before i've just been mm. you know and i was i was tethering whether to message you and say i don't know if i'm going to be able to record today mm. um but then i thought that maybe there's an opportunity for me to talk about how i'm feeling mm. yeah. uh, not because i actually care without sounding rude to our listeners and audience <laughs> not because i care what they think about it but yeah. because it's just it's it's therapy for me to get it out mm. um yeah in long form mm. um, bro, you know bro, some things that helped me um definitely was doing salat on the prophet like on mm. the way to work okay mm. because um as we know what what do we say we say uh, the prophet muhammad we say sallallahu alaihi wasallam what does that actually mean well you know we always translate it as peace and blessings upon him it's a dua to send peace and blessings upon him and you know the hadith goes man salla alayya salatan sallallahu biha ashara uh, whoever sends salat on me then allah will send salat on him allah will send peace and blessings upon them so mm. that's why they say if you send salat on the prophet then allah will give you a sense of calmness and a sense of uh, peace and blessings kind of mm. thing so um i used to just repeat that on the way to work um i you know i i do believe it worked you know i i'm always <laughs> i'm like uh, dig too deep into the whole um, psychology side of thing oh is it placebo is it not but it it did work right um and then also i'm just i don't know i think trying to be prepared fee having a sense of i'm prepared for whatever comes um that that helped uh so it's like if i noticed if i had a sick lesson plan versus i had a just a average one then I would feel less anxious because I just yeah. feel more prepared, right? That's more the, I guess, the rational mind kind of thing. And then um, also, bro, I, I, you know, pray in the masjid really helps. It's, it's, it's a few minutes every day that I actually felt like absolute no anxiety, like yeah. calm, absolute calmness. Um, whenever I had the time, uh, the, they used to do a, a class. I can't remember if it was daily or... It, it was a uh, it was a uh, going through Sahih Bukhari and just uh, you know talking about some of the benefits from the Hadith, and again that was my time, just sitting in the Masjid is a place of peace, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I really appreciated those kind of moments, so that that's what I can remember at least that I used to do to help. Definitely, definitely, bro. And and you know that's <laughs> as 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 um as great as that is i think that's one of my difficulties is even getting to the masjid these days mm. um yeah the time because uh, when i was training for that long mm. i was in an area mm. that there were no messages whatsoever yeah uh, i have to travel quite far to find a masjid so i was mm -hmm. very isolated in, in that sense um mm. and even now it's like you know and subhanallah i'd never had to join a, a uh, even though i did the role for two years before i never had to join a prayer out of extreme uh, necessity mm. um until and then this has only been three or four days and i had to do it on my second day yeah you know yeah. or third day whatever mm. it was uh, yeah. which that's what really just really frustrated mm. me because then you and start I, thinking like why am i even alive <laughs> you know it's like yeah. my my purpose of life is to worship allah and yeah. now I'm voluntarily doing something which is taking me away from that. Exactly. But then, oh, but then I need the job. But then this, but it drives you nuts, doesn't it? It, it does. And you know what I will say is that, you know, sometimes, and I don't know if any of the listeners can relate, but when I'm in a situation like this, which I believe I'm in now, it's like you you are on a, that stormy ocean, okay? And yeah. the, the only thing that's giving you focus and an anxiety, so you're focusing on the anxiety, is the ocean that's surrounding you, and there's nothing mm -hmm. else in sight. But I think this is why it's important to, tan to to 
to realize a tangible goal in front of you that you can focus on because the moment that island comes up on the horizon that's mm. what your goal is your goal is to sail that boat to that island mm. and suddenly you're not looking around at the water as much you're focusing on getting to that island um mm. that's what gets you through um and that's basically i think that's the struggle i've had at the moment is because i'm still on an ocean that doesn't have an island <laughs> that mm. i can sail towards i haven't got yeah. a tangible real goal that i can say that's where i need to get to physically mm. like i can describe each aspect of it and i know you know step by step to get to that um that's why i'm struggling because right now it's like i've just been f- thrown into the water and i don't actually know what direction to go to mm. <laughs> to get to wherever island this is um and yeah I, I was working on it before i was working on trying to visualize this island of mine but because now all i can think about is this is the water around me i can't think about where, where this island is. yeah really. yeah yeah the only um, thing bro is don't assume that it will continue you know inshallah it won't continue inshallah mm. you know again like i said it's normal to feel anxious with a brand new thing for the first two weeks three weeks four weeks so inshallah after it may it may take a month but inshallah you'll calm down and just look at your colleagues around you who are more experienced and how you know, I'm sure most of them or many of them were very anxious at the beginning, and now yeah. they're look how they're doing it. So, and, and you know what? Uh, mm. On that note, I think I know. I, I feel like I'm battling everything you say, and I, I, it's really bad. <laughs> but I feel like uh, one thing is like different people are in different ways. There are a few people that are, are really, you know, quite level headed and stuff. But then there's, mm. there's always those people that just use humor as a, as yes. a way to sort of deal with stuff. But the problem yeah. is. Our humor as Muslims is a certain way, and their mm. humor is is a very different <laughs> fish, you know. Um, so, being inundated with non-Muslims and surrounded with non-Muslims of all sort of different shapes and sizes, you're once again isolated on that ocean because mm. no one's gonna get, you know, yeah. no one's gonna get that you. Although they respect it, they respect your your deen and it, you know your. your your mm, obligations to your mm. religion your commitments right and they really mm. do uh, I, I actually feel strongly about that I think they really do respect that um, whether that's because of you know legislation that they need to respect that or whether it's because they actually believe it that's another thing Allah knows best okay but there's a mm. level of respect there that you know I need to do what I need to do and I don't really get debated on that but mm-hmm. because no one else is there to go through it with you because yeah, what Muslim cool. would do, what what practicing Muslim that values their religion would put themselves in this position, you know? Mm, that is um, right, yeah. So I, you've not I, come I, across anyone similar to you in that sense? Uh, not in the same role that I do. Mm. I think there's been, I think I, 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 there is one Muslim woman that doesn't, you know, probably works in the office or works in some sort of part of the mm. office or whatever, mm. that has used the prayer room that mm. they have there. Mm. Other than that, I go into that prayer room every day, and it's mm. it's always the same way I've left it, mm. you know. And I deliberately, I deliberately, you know what? It's actually funny that you made me think. I deliberately leave things in a particular way that will let me know if someone's been in there or not. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Is there anyone out there? Yeah. So I like I'll fold the prayer mat in a particular way and put it somewhere. Yeah. yeah. That it wasn't before, and I'll make mm. a mental note, and like I'll stack a particular set of books in a certain way, or whatever. I know it yeah. sounds really ridiculous, mm. <laughs> but it is maybe a cry for help. <laughs> yeah, these are these little games you play, just you know, out of curiosity. Just to see, because I'm not sure, because I'm like, well, this room is always clean, is it? Yeah. And I check the bin. I always check the bin. I know mm. it sounds awful. I check the bin to see if there's any th- new rubbish in there, yeah. or is it literally just what I've put in there? Mm. You know. Now I'm sure there's people that come in and clean it, but mm. whether there's people coming to use it, I don't know. Mm. So oh, check the sink as well. There's a little door thing that I found. Yeah. Check if the sink's wet, if it's been used. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy, bro. <laughs> you know, as as crazy as it is, is not crazy. Like you can, I don't know. Personally, I can completely understand like why somebody would do these kind of things. Like it makes sense, man. Like what the yeah. hell? Yeah, definitely, bro. Definitely, it's part of that. But yeah, inshallah, we'll see how it goes, man. Inshallah, khair, inshallah, whatever. I mean, bro, I'll tell you one thing, yeah. That that year when I was going through this, it's the, it was the most challenging year, even now. I, I say it was probably still the most challenging year of my life and the year of potentially the most, definitely the year of most closest to Allah, no doubt about that. Mm. And I obviously, as a person, my my skills, my social skills, whatever, my, even my confidence 
maybe not in that time, but afterwards, having gone through it, my confidence increased. Um, so a lot of development went on in that time. So, you know, in the mala isn't it? Of course. Um, and, yeah. you know, I, I've always said it, like, without the discomfort, what would make, motivate you to move? Like, without 100%. me feeling this way, then, you know, if I was fine with this, and this is where I'd always be, mm. and if I didn't feel fine, then you're going to need a trigger to get you out. Mm. Otherwise, you just make an awful mistake and get fired, and that doesn't really bode well for you. Mm, <laughs> you know? Of course, but, yeah. Um, but we'll see, inshallah. I've enjoyed talking about it, and I'll probably keep talking about it for a few more episodes because <laughs> the reality of mind is that we always just talk about what's going on <laughs> as opposed mm. to, you know. And I think, you know, when there's not too much on my mind, I find it easier to talk about any other topic. But mm -hmm. when this is all I can think about, it's really difficult. And as you can, as a lot of people can probably tell, a lot of our audience can tell that a lot of our m recent episodes have kept going back and forth on this sort of, um, sort of topic area of employment being balancing your life but i think people enjoy it because a lot of people relate to it a lot of people mm. have a lot of our audience are maybe of similar ages so mm. they have similar challenges mm -hmm. but um i think i have to start wrapping things up inshallah inshallah okay. bro yeah inshallah. um thank you for Thank you, I mean, for listening to me. <laughs> uh, and thank, I thank the audience for, for, for listening this far into my ramblings and, and I mean, uh, solid advice. Because <laughs> once, like we said before, you are pretty much my counsellor. <laughs> um, Who was my counsellor, bro, when I was going through it? Subhanallah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's crazy, isn't it? Um, what was I going to say? Yeah, one thing I want to talk about is um, with I don't I know if I've spoken to you about this. I mean, I'm sure I have, but about opening up Mind Heist to anyone who wants to sort of um, collaborate with us or sponsor us or something along those lines. Uh, mm -hmm. If you have a, bus a small business or or project or anything that um, you think more people should hear about, and you think that the Mind Heist listeners could benefit from because you are one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, send us an email mindhighestpodcast at gmail.com uh, anything at all like we can ru run ads for you on uh, Mind Heist we can review your sort of business whatever it is your project have a look at it uh, there's people that I've spoken to that you know writing books or writing articles or have a website or whatever anything beneficial mm -hmm. we can have a look at that inshallah mm -hmm. um, also send in your questions uh, actually you can go to mindhighestpodcast.com now can't you yeah <laughs> yeah and and pretty much everything's on there which is really cool you can actually listen to the episodes on there you can set, send send questions on there basically it's like a redirection site isn't it so anything you click on will take you yeah. to where you need to go so it's very straightforward and i mean it's done a good job on putting that together very simple and easy to use so mindhighspodcast.com mm -hmm. to, to get in touch with us uh, whether anonymously or with email or to listen to our episodes mm -hmm. etc mm -hmm. uh I think that's about it. Is there anything I've forgotten? Right, I just wanted to clarify, actually, I just remembered. Um, you know, episode 48, we're talking about traveling with niqab and all of that. Uh -huh. uh, I want to, um, because my friend, you know, he's a listener and he, he contacted me about this point about UAE, um, the, the going through passport control and UAE with niqab. Uh -huh. He said, he said, um, the, the the way it used to be actually is that uh, a, a lady would check um, your face if you're wearing niqab, uh, uh -huh. but then there would be still men around. But it would be, they would get a woman for you that would be the one checking, right? Yeah. But now he said, and this is amazing, he said, uh, I, probably the first in the world, there is a specific niqab lane in oh, the wow. airport where you go through in complete privacy and there'll be only women there to check uh, your brilliant. identity. Yeah. Um, and another point he made was interesting. He said, in fiqh, like in uh, any time you need to identify yourself, even the fuqaha who say that niqab is fard, they say at this point, you're obligated to show, your, to identify yourself, right? So yeah. it's uh, basically what he's trying to say is it doesn't seem that it is an obligation upon the airport to facilitate that you uh you you could stay covered basically right, right? right maybe right. It, it would be good but the, these fuqaha and this is from hundreds of years ago they said for example if you're in court and you're giving testimony and you wear niqab 
then you must uncover your face because this is a time where you need to be identified. And there's no obviously no sin on you for that. So he just added that as well uh, as a side point. So inter- interesting stuff. Yeah, man. Uh, very good episode, bro. Jazakallah khairan for being vulnerable and sharing. And uh, that's why I wanted to do this episode now because uh, it's fresh in your mind. And yeah. hopefully, you know, you shared the, the raw kind of feelings right now. And bro, what I hope, inshallah, ya Rab, in a couple of months, we could do a follow up and you're going to be like, yeah, alhamdulillah, it's better now. I've got used to it, this and that. Inshallah, bro, inshallah. inshallah. It'll, it'll be like that. Okay, uh, f- go to mindheistpodcast.com for anything, getting in touch with us, anonymous questions, etc. And see you in the ne- next episode, inshallah. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Shadwan la ilaha la anta. Astaghfiruka wa tubu ilaik. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.